How's it going today? It's going great, man. Good to see you. Likewise. I'm super stoked. Um, Dorita and I have known each other for a couple years now. Uh, I think the first time we met in person was when Cascade did its big user group um, conference down in Portland. And it was just such a cool experience. And even, yeah, I met the previous CEO in Portland at the 10X conference. So got a long history with Cascade. Um, but I'm just so grateful for you to come on here today because I know people are committed to getting better strategy execution. Um, and I just appreciate you sharing with everybody. So why don't you tell people a little bit about your background and, and about who you are, and then um, we'll get people into the rooms and start asking some questions. Sounds good. Yeah, Anthony, we met pre-COVID. That feels like a lifetime ago. It's hard to <laughs> kind of separate your brain that way. But yeah, my name is Reed Gridley. Um, I'm the global head of sales and services for Cascade, although that kind of doesn't give you a really good picture. I kind of work all over the business. Um, we're still a bootstrap startup. We've been around for about seven years or so based out of actually Sydney, Australia, but we have a global presence. Um, I help manage our US and North American branch over here in Portland, Oregon. Um, like I said, my name is Reed. I've been with the company for, oh geez, around about four and a half years now. So I'm one of the fairly original people in the SaaS world that tends to be quite a while. Um, and before that, I, I got my MBA and um, engineering degrees in Germany in the US and ran a business for a couple of years out in Wisconsin before moving to the West Coast. So been uh, all over the, the industry map here and landed in software, working at a company that thankfully gets to work with all sorts of industries and solve all sorts of problems. So yeah, excited to be here and talk a little bit about strategy. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we're obviously going to talk about the software side of things. And it's not just the software for software's sake. It's really looking at best practices for tracking, looking at best practices for structuring your plan and all of that. But one of the reasons that's so in full transparency, you know, we have a partnership with Cascade um, to support them. And it's just because we've seen all of the different strategic planning software. This is the best one, the most affordable one, the cleanest UX, the most accessible for being able to like track and record your strategic plan. And as you know, we like to do things easy for people and that's why we chose it. So some are a lot more expensive and of course, you know, there's value for everything, right? Um, but we just really like Cascade and we vibe with their their Cascadia global background. So um, really cool about that. So I'm just excited. If you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Any questions for Reed? Any questions about tracking? But Reed, I mean, maybe before we get into the sort of technical aspect of today, um, you know, one of the critical parts of the strategic planning process, if we look at strategic planning, there's actually creating the plan, which is like 20% of it. And then there's the tracking and the execution. So maybe from your perspective, since you see so many plans, you know, why is it so important to be able to track and measure your plan effectively? Uh, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, it's funny you say I see a lot of plans I actually counted in 2020. And I think I saw 1,200 strategic plans, roughly about that. It, it, it gets a little glaze over the eyes after a certain point, but I'm still excited about it. But yeah, I mean, like you said, you said maybe 20% of it. I would argue it might even be more like 10% of it is the actual planning element of things. It's it's just, you know, it's the age old story of the team goes away into a board retreat or an executive management retreat. They come up with a really nice plan. Everyone feels really good about it. And then they actually go to the office on the Monday morning and then the plan just kind of gets forgotten. It's something that's become a bit of a stereotype in our industry, but it's the stereotype that still exists for a reason and we're trying to fight it every single day. So that's really the simplest way to look at it, but the more complex way to look at it is it's the changing of the landscape that we're in right now. I mean, democratization of data is a real thing and COVID made it happen 10 times faster than it was ever going to happen before. So what I mean by democratization of data, it's making agile teams the future of the workplace having teams be autonomous and be able to make decisions on their own and move quickly while still avoiding silos those are going to be the best businesses whether they're small or huge for the future and that's where we see the best strategies the best clients moving forward is in that sort of agile space where they're able to say okay we have five departments and each of these can come up with their own strategies, but it's not gonna be this big monolithic exercise where we come up with a top level plan and then we come up with individual plans that takes us weeks and then 
we look at those over the course of the next three years. That's just not the way that business is done anymore. You have to be able to move quicker than that. So the planning becomes such a small part of it in reality and the actual execution, the ability to change the plan, to adapt it, to communicate on it, to draw results out of it, use it to drive decision-making. That's where the future is moving and it has to be done faster. So that's where we're trying to position our tool more and more these days is rather than this just sort of place where you can execute that big three to five year plan and, and track it once a month, once a quarter, that's great, but we want to move more and more into the space of this agile workforce because coming out of COVID, man, you can really see the companies that did that well and didn't do that well. And I think the world's only going to get more like that. Mm, absolutely. Maybe we can turn off the screen share while we, we chat a little bit because mm -hmm. that way we can see a little bit more of the facial expression when I ask you probing see more of me. <laughs> I love that. Everybody, read Gridley, everyone. Um, okay, so... I think something that was really important that you shared was the, the nature of the agile. And so we see a lot of organizations that have set this four year plan. This like, this is the four year plan. This is what we're working yeah. through. Um, how do you see agile strategy development aligning with that like four year plan structure? And then how are you seeing it in your like 1000 plans uh, totally. executed? Yeah. So I, I, I use the term agile and I'm always hesitant to drop business terms like that because it can make certain people just disengage like, oh, here's another flavor of the month kind of thing. So when I say agile, let me just preface this by saying it's more of a mindset than it is like you have to call this a rock and you have to call this a or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just the matter of being able to move quickly and respond to changes and adjust your strategy and continuing to actually act on it. So when we look at that for your plan, one of the major reasons why we see people fail with their strategic plans is that something changes. It makes that four year plan irrelevant and then people disengage from it. So they see that plan. They're like, well, that doesn't really speak to the reality anymore. COVID is the ultimate example of that. OK, we're not going to expand our office presence this year. That doesn't make any sense. How do we maintain that four year plan, not just throw it out, but still have it be relevant to what we're actually working on? That's where that sort of agile mentality can really fit into it is having that four-year plan, but being able to break it into manageable sections that you can actually execute. So granted, everything I'm saying here, let me preface, it's a little different industry to industry. You know, universities aren't going to move on a week-to-week -week basis. We understand that. It's going to be more long-term. But for the most part, most businesses that we're talking about here need that ability to think sort of long-term, medium-term, and short-term in a really nice balanced effort. And having that for your plan is great, but you need to be able to break that down into manageable pieces. Usually on a quarterly basis is kind of the, the aim that we push people towards, which you'll see represented in a lot of structures like OKRs and um, McKinsey's Horizons. They like to think in the quarterly sort of breakdown so that you're making sure that you're focusing on the next three months. Absolutely. While still not losing sight of that for your plan. Hmm. I think one of the, the, the something changes is a part and it's like the symptom, but I think the biggest part with strategy as a whole is that engagement. Like a, a why I like cascade, but why tracking is so important is the engagement. Um, you know, I, I was having a coaching session for myself the other day and I am like a master of vision and like, that's my job. And then my coach is like, yeah, you're probably not connected to your goals. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, it was just like, I know what the goals are, but I don't have like a relationship with them. And it, that thing was like, oh, the relationship to my goals, then it just feels like work. It just feels like tasks versus like, hey, here's the bigger picture that I'm going to put in place. Um, and so really being able to have that engagement with it, however fast it goes, is the thing that's going to support it. Um, I actually have a poll for people as we get into the room and then read i'm going to ask you let's see how this poll works i'm trying all the cool functions so i'd love to see where people are at in terms of their tracking um so it should pop up on the right hand side there where it says polls um, and if you're on youtube the question is do you currently track your strategy no yes but not well and then yes we're masters of regular reporting so if you've got any feedback of how you track strategy on youtube please let us know um reed you mentioned about depending on industry and sector. And obviously if you've got a 10 or 20 year cycle, you probably don't need to check quarterly to a degree. Um, do you have any case studies or experiences from small businesses, medium sized businesses that have used this tracking well and that relationship and engagement well to support them that people can sort of draw from their experience? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that you mentioned yourself going through that exercise because sometimes I like to just use Cascade as an example. I mean, we have like 45 employees. We're still a rapidly growing, but still a small business at the end of the day. Um, we're a startup, you know, that hasn't taken any funding. So we've grown very naturally over time. And we look at ourselves sometimes in the mirror and say, same as you, Anthony, am I really doing, am I really connected to these things? I mean, we talk strategy every single day with people and yet, Engagement is always the hardest part, even at Cascade, even with people that are all know our software, getting them to actually engage with the plan can sometimes be tricky. And it, it's an evergreen exercise. I guess that's that's the main piece that I always come back to is that this is not something that you kind of set and forget. It has to become ingrained in your in your culture or it just won't ever yield the results. I like to equate it to meditating. If you've ever done a lot of meditating, you have to do it every day. And once you do it every day, it's, you start to think, how could I live my life without doing this every day? It resets me. It puts my mind at ease. It helps me concentrate on what's important in life. That's the same with your strategic plan, your strategic culture. And if you don't have that as part of your routine, it can feel really arduous and difficult to kind of get into. So it's a bit of an aside, but yeah, we have a ton of businesses that have gone through this process and have landed in a very similar sort of position. Um, one example I have is this um, this private school I've been working with for the last, geez, probably about a year and a half called the Minnehaha Academy. They're based out of Minnesota and the Minnetonka region, if you've ever been there, really, really gorgeous part of the Midwest in the U.S. Um, but basically, it's like a 150-person organization, pretty small. They own five schools in Minnesota. They've got um, most of those staff are teachers. But they have this team of centralized people that are maybe, you know, 40, 45 people that manage all the different schools. And they have this very top-level strategy. And forever, they've been around for a long, long time, decades, they would basically just have this top-level plan that would try to push these schools in one direction, but it was really just the principal at each school and the overall organizational body that really knew anything about this. And they would look at it and they would talk about it once a year or so, but it really didn't have an impact on the school itself. But when COVID hit, as with so many different people, it really was a wake-up call to them. They saw all of these problems arise from trying to educate students via online courses and, and Zoom and all those sorts of things. They saw just a complete sort of disintegration of their various schools in terms of alignment. They were just acting as independent bodies and they weren't even all in the same well awareness level of what was going on regulatory wise and whatnot. So they leaned on Cascade to bring it all together. And that only works when you drive it down to the people. And that's the piece that people like to like to kind of skip over is, okay, great. We're, we're going to focus on strategy. We're going to look at it more often. We're going to use a tool to do it, but we're going to still keep it within just our core management team. And that's not really the answer. You're going to get about two thirds of the value, but you're not going to really get the value of driving it down to the people that are actually managing the work and need to know how they align to the big picture and the big strategy. So, Creating a culture around it is, is one part, as I alluded to earlier, but just empowering people, that democratization of data, getting the people who actually own the work involved with the strategic thinking, the development of the strategy, and then ultimately the execution of the strategy, bringing them in to voice their opinions, make their updates, but then give them a place to do it that's not super arduous, that's not a pain. And that's kind of where Cascade is hope is trying to fit in and, and solve. Yeah, I think it's one of those, like, especially during COVID, one of those, like, communication structures that supports the planning. You're like, hey, how do I keep our team engaged with the goal? Having a central place to look at it because you just don't have a whiteboard that everybody can walk through. So, um, no, I love that. And I think getting everybody involved and, again, making sure that it's structured in the right way. So uh, why don't we jump into the demo? Thank you for that, Reid. Uh, looks like from the people that are on the chat, 20, 33% uh, of people do not track their strategy, 50% of people track it, but not well, and about 16% are masters of regular reporting. So uh, I think that there's probably something for everybody here, um, but why don't we jump into the demo? You can show people a little bit about how Cascade works, and I might interject at different times to say like, hey, how can we include this? What are some <laughs> takeaways there? Yeah, that sounds good. And those poll numbers are almost exactly what we have experienced. So that's pretty, that's pretty good to see reflected in the poll. Um, I would say probably about a third of businesses out there just don't look at strategy at all. Um, and probably about half do, and they just don't even know how bad it is, or they do know how bad it is, and it just hasn't quite come about yet. So that's good to see that your crowd is 
pretty on point with what we've experienced. All right, well, I'm going to hop over to do just a quick demo of Cascade here. I'm probably just going to take about 10 minutes to go through this. I'll start with a very, very short presentation explaining a little bit about why we exist, although I've alluded to that already, so I won't spend too much time on it. And then I'll show you around a couple of the main features of Cascade, mainly focusing on the visuals that really sort of drive the point home of why is this good? And then we'll talk a little bit about sort of, um, you know, best practices around using Cascade, but also just strategic planning and execution um, as far as we see fit. So I'm going to start here with this presentation. Cascade, the whole point is that we're trying to achieve your business results. So. A lot of people like to focus on all of the sort of methods like alignment or collaboration. Those things are great, but you don't align just for the sake of alignment. You're trying to achieve your strategy, which is ultimately your business results. And this is, or should be, the most important part of your entire business is trying to achieve the things you set out to do, obviously. So Cascade's entire purpose is to help you achieve those things. And we're probably the only tool that you have that directly works towards trying to achieve the actual reasons why you exist as a business. Uh, it might seem a little conceptual, but thousands of organizations use Cascade to do exactly that. We're a global company. Like I said, we, we are based out of Australia, but we operate all over the world. We're very prominent in North America. It's probably our biggest market, but we work with some of the biggest brands out there. But we also work with a lot of small businesses, um, pretty much anybody that has a strategic plan, be it a two-person company, or a 2000 person company, you can use Cascade to manage that strategic plan. And what makes us unique? Why do people choose to use Cascade? It's this sort of stepped process that most people wanna to go to to achieve that sort of nirvana of actually hitting their business results. So it starts with visibility. That's the piece where most organizations don't have right now. So all the people that answered no to do you currently track your strategy, you probably don't have that visibility over, okay, how are we actually doing? How are various people fitting in? That's the first step we're trying to do is just give you visibility over what your plan is, how does it fit into the big picture, who sits where, all those kind of things. And then the next step in that process is to start driving accountability to that strategy. Okay, I have a strategy in place. Now I actually wanna hold people accountable to it. I wanna achieve this plan this year. In order to do that, I need to be able to make sure that it's progressing on time. And if it's not, I can make the right adjustments and hold the right people accountable. And once you have that accountability in place, which is a big cultural shift for a lot of organizations, you can start working towards aligning people to the big picture. This is where Cascade starts really driving a lot of value and starts really pushing you towards those business results is when you can get people not only on the same page, but you can ask any individual employee, Melanie, where you fit into this top level corporate objective of expand our brand. Oh, well, I own this project and this KPI and I know exactly how that fits in. Imagine if you a world where you could actually say those things confidently. That's that's pretty close to strategic nirvana. And, and I find that that is a huge challenge when it comes to. Um, well, tiered organizations, like one that aren't like 20, 30 people, but once you get to that 30, 50, 50 to 100, especially in big change projects where people are like, how do I fit in three levels away from this vision? Um, it takes time to get to that level, but it's so worth it because that's sort of the root cause of that low engagement that you see across organizations. So sorry to jump in, Reed, but that's just like a big sticking point that I see that this being great for. No, it's perfect. You couldn't say it better. That's definitely what we're trying to combat. If you can get your people so that they feel like they understand where they fit in, you've won two thirds of the battle because they're already going to be more motivated. They're going to be able to celebrate success. It's a huge part of Cascade and just strategy is using it as an engine to celebrate your success and also communicate better when they're falling behind or under-resourced or whatever it may be. That only works when they're really aligned. Otherwise, they're going to feel siloed off and not really aware of you know, how that works and how it impacts the big picture. So that is a big part of it. But ultimately, we're pushing towards those business results. That alignment, accountability, visibility are only methods that are allowing you to achieve those business results. So let's show this in practice here. And I'm going to start in our demo instance of Cascade on a backend screen that you probably wouldn't even go to if you were setting up your instance. But it's really important to start demos here because I'm gonna click this little button here where I have all my users built out. I'm gonna click this little tree icon and this is going to show me my organizational chart. This is something that, you're gonna, that everyone has to set up at some point when they're building out Cascade is you're gonna set up your org chart. It's pretty straightforward. 
as you build it out, it's going to naturally create this nice view. And I'm going to be able to see at a very high level here, what are my various people or who are my various people and where do they fit into the organizational structure? Pretty straightforward. But the reason why I'm showing this is because as Anthony was just saying, these people down here, three, four layers deep in the org chart are what make or break your strategic execution. Strategy cannot stay within this top level. It needs to drive all the way down to the Melanie's and Megan's of the world. This is what will make or break the success of your strategic plan. So when we look at an organization like this mock organization, Meerkat Cycling, they're a medium sized manufacturer of bicycles in the Pacific Northwest. We've got our org chart up here and a lot of people like to focus up here. I'm gonna focus throughout this demo on how someone like Melanie contributes all the way up to the top level strategy that Emily and team have set out. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the main page of Cascade, which is our planner page. So this planner page is over here on the left under plan. And this is where I'm gonna see my strategic plan and plans. I can have as many as I want in Cascade. At a very high level, you're gonna see I've got my vision and values up top here. I can embed videos or any sort of additional content to really bring these to life and show sort of what does this mean to us as an organization. And then down here, I have the more actionable part of my strategy. By default, we call these focus areas. They're essentially just categorizations of the work that you're looking towards. And then I have my top level objectives. And if I click into those objectives, you can see why we're called Cascade. We have underneath those objectives, a series of projects and KPIs that are driving towards achieving that top level objective. So you'll notice right away, this terminology objective with projects and KPIs underneath it, it's pretty standard stuff. We've got an outcome we're working towards, continue our top line growth that outpaces our industry, very conceptual high level outcome. But then underneath that, we've got a very tangible KPI that brings us back to earth. Okay, are you actually growing in that way? And then we've got projects that'll push us towards that growth. This is kind of the default structure of Cascade, but we have a lot of ability to customize this. Anthony, you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the the importance where I think the it takes rigor to go through this process. And I read, I'd love actually to see what your experience is around getting teams to set those specific measurable goals that we found like bridging those like objectives where it's qualitative and people are like, okay, I can get behind that, but then actually getting into the specifics, which is really the gold of, of uh, gold of Cascade when you can actually track it. So what's your experience been getting teams to commit to KPIs and, and break it down past the objective level? Totally. So that's one of the main things that we run into from a software perspective is we'll, we'll onboard a new client. And they'll tell us in the sales process, hey, we have, a, we have a strategy. It's going to be a turnkey process. We're going to upload it. And then if you can help us train some of our users, we'll be good to go really quick. And that, that all sounds really good. And then they'll send us their strategy. And their strategy is essentially a long to-do list. This is one of the most common things we run into. It'll be, at best, it'll have some really big outcomes they're working towards. So like this example I'm highlighting, grow in a healthy, sustainable manner. Okay, this is something your finance department is likely going to own. And we might have some things we need to do, like we need to make some adjustments based on an audit that we're conducting. We need to cut down some finance, financial investments that are no longer valid because of COVID. Whatever, we have these projects underneath it that you would logically think would help you grow in a healthy, sustainable manner. But without these KPIs, like your profit margin and your number of audits performed in the year, things like that, you can't actually know, am I growing in a healthy, sustainable way? So that's really the result of it is going to be measured in metrics. And that's just sort of the way business works for better or worse is you have to be able to measure things. Otherwise it's just gonna be a feel good exercise. So this is ultimately going to be easier for certain things than others. Um, it's easy when you're looking at things like market share, like profit margin, like anything on your P&E or your balance sheet is gonna be pretty easy to measure. But when it gets to more conceptual things like employee satisfaction or, um, you know, best in class, things like that, it's a little bit more difficult to track. But coming up with some version of a metric for every objective is critical to being able to actually engage your staff and show them, hey, the strategy actually matters because there is a right and wrong answer to this stuff. There is an actual hey, this, we did grow in a healthy, sustainable manner and accomplishing four projects doesn't tell us that. It's, 
is our profit margin healthy? And at the end of the at the end of the day, if you can't show that, you're going to get disengagement from your strategic plan, and ultimately that makes this whole exercise at best a feel good exercise, and at worst a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. You need some. I love that some version of a metric. And what we like to say is if there's no tracking, your plan is lacking. So just make sure that you have some sort of tracking as part of your plan. So Reed, I'll, I'll let you jump back in. I can't promise I'm going to be able to rhyme that well. So that'll be relied on Anthony. So that structure of objective KPI project, that's our default out of Cascade. We have other ways of setting that up. It's very customizable, like pretty much everything in Cascade. So just for this plan, our top level corporate strategic plan, we have the ability to adjust this so that not only can I, for example, say, all right, we have maybe something different than um, just in a, a project or a KPI, like maybe we also need to be able to track risks that are arising underneath this. And then I can build like mitigation efforts that go under risks, whatever you want this model to be. We can customize this to look exactly how you want it to. It's a really straightforward process, as you saw there. And then I can also customize what a project is. Do we need to capture more complex fields like sponsor, budget, things like that? You can edit this and really dive into all the specifics around how you track your projects, your spend, your sponsor, your portfolio. So Cascade is quite customizable in the sense that it allows you to really build out, oops, took me to my wrist plan here. Um, it really allows you to build on a plan by plan basis how you want to structure your strategy and engage with it. But our default is what we usually recommend, which is that objective project KPI. Now, as you saw, as I was just clicking around there, we have the ability to have as many plans in Cascade as you'd like. Uh, this is a really powerful feature of Cascade as we're looking at clients that have more than 30, 40, 50 employees and they have multiple departments that ability to have a lot of different plans built out here and then align them to each other is a really powerful feature. So for example, I'll just briefly show you in this marketing and sales plan, you can see it, it looks and feels quite a bit different. We removed the vision and values because it's the same as the parent company. Um, we have different focus areas, but then I have to a top level KPI here, achieve our revenue for the whole company. But then if I go back to my top level plan, you can see that that same revenue goal sits within an objective of my corporate plan. So I can build out individual plans underneath it and pick and choose which pieces align to the top level plan. It allows you to smash those silos while still acting in that agile nature. So I can give autonomy and authority to my marketing team. Hey, build out your plan. But at the end of the day, I want to see alignment, at least to a certain degree, to the top level plan and make sure we're all on the same page. We have this feature here called the Cascade Map that helps you visualize just that. So when I click this by default, it's going to show me for my corporate strategic plan underneath each of my focus areas, I can see those various objectives that I'm working on. But if I click here to all plans, this is going to show me from a very high level, and I, I know it's probably a little small on your screen, but I've got this corporate strategy up top here, that's the one I was just looking at. And then here are all my sub plans. And you can see we can nest as many of these down as we want to go. But if I go over here to my marketing and sales plan, I can very quickly see, all right, who's involved with this? I've got 24 users active owning stuff within my marketing and sales plan. I can see I have 49 goals and three focus areas. I can see how many open risks I have. So I might need to jump in and mitigate some of those things as a corporate manager. But then most importantly, I can see the alignment help is going to immediately show me 76% of the goals are aligned to your top level plan. That's probably a really healthy number for this organization. They've got 25% of the things that are their own stuff. It's not really relevant to the top level corporate plan. And then the rest of it, three quarters of it is super relevant and stuff that already ties in and pushes the dial on how my corporate strategy is doing. And then that team can go in even deeper if they want. It looks like they just started building this business development plan. Mary was starting to work on that, but it doesn't have much built out yet. But then I have like a fixed gear project. So they built out an entire plan just for a new major project they're working on, and they can customize that. Ultimately, Cascade is meant to be that place where you can manage any sort of work and call it a plan and connect it or not connect it to the other plans in Cascade ultimately driving up to that top level corporate plan. So you have really good alignment and collaboration on how you're trying to achieve that strategy.
Cool. <clears throat> I've got a couple of questions. I've got a question for myself because as I look at that, I see the alignment, which is very cool. Which I, I don't know if it's a new feature, so I'm wondering what's right. new and what's not. Uh, the focus areas and the goals and the open risks. How are you incorporating that, like as a best practices within Cascade? So that's one question. The other question I have from the chat is from YL is would time uh, spent on planning increase over time, as in the more measuring the more planning you would do. So what have you seen there? And then uh, and then I'll ask you the next question after. So let's start with that one. Yeah, so we'll start, we'll start with that um, that question about time spend. It, it's sort of a, a yes and a no, the increase over time. The yes is that as you start with your strategic planning efforts, most clients that come to us start up here. They start with their corporate plan. And that's why they purchase Cascade. So they have a top level plan, or maybe it's a big departmental plan, depending on the size of your organization. And you're trying to come up with a better way to do this or a way to do it. You haven't done it at all before. So we start here. And usually we're going to start at a minimum of monthly or quarterly updates. We like to really push towards monthly, but sometimes it's quarterly. It's still going to take a decent amount of time because we have to figure out how to ingrain this in our culture. We might have to add a couple meetings on the calendar until people start looking at this on their own. We might have to start enforcing this a little bit with reminders and just getting this really in the swing of things. So it's going to be a bit of a time commitment in the beginning to get this really flowing and working. But over time, you're going to have to spend less and less time because ultimately your people are just going to come in and make a very quick update to what they own and then log out. And it's a really natural process. So at Cascade, for example, I update my strategy every week, every two weeks at the very late at least. And within that strategy, it takes me probably 15 minutes. And I've got maybe eight goals assigned to me within our top level plan. So it reduces time over time. It reduces the spend over time. But on the flip side is you'll probably start doing it more often and you'll probably start doing it at scale to a more granular degree. And that's where the time will go up, but it's going to be a really positive going up because it's gonna be doing things that either you weren't doing before and you should have been doing or things you were already doing, but now you're doing it more efficiently. So for example, a lot of our organizations are already doing this in Excel and they have a big behemoth Excel document that is just a mess and it takes them a long time. They have versioning issues. They're chasing people to get updates. They are trying to figure out if this last thing that they edited is the most recent update or if somebody overwrote that in the SharePoint document. And it's a bit of a mess. Cascade will supplement that and make that whole time spend way less, but you might be ed editing it way more if you're getting value out of looking at, for example, a marketing plan, even more in depth, a fixed gear plan. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Over time, the, it, it's less and less time. Iterating the strategy starts to feel really natural. We like to advise doing a keep, start, stop type exercise where on a quarterly or biannual basis, you're taking a look at your plan and saying, all right, this is the stuff that should keep going, even though it's not done. These are the things we should kill because they're no longer relevant. These are the things we should add to the plan. And just keeping it evergreen and doing that, once it gets ingrained in your culture, that's that stuff starts taking you know an hour long meeting with your your core team. Yeah, and I think that th there was a question in the chat about uh, what makes Cascade different from the Agile framework and the methodology. Just speaking that, like, and you know, I'm not an expert on Agile, but the keep, stop, start, and just making sure that you're adapting it regularly. And it's not necessarily that the focus areas are changing but the goals, sub goals, objectives, and risks are the ones that you're adopting. But can you maybe speak to Cascade's uh, malleability in terms of framework? Yeah, exactly. So in terms of framework, honestly, our default framework of this, sorry, go back to the um, plan here. Our default framework is already not too far from the Agile. We just call things a little bit differently here, but you can adjust these to match exactly the Agile framework or the balanced scorecard framework or Blue Oceans theory or literally any sort of framework. OKRs is a really co common one where you'll have objective, you'll change these to key results and then put actions under the key results. Really, really straightforward to adjust Cascade to match any sort of functionality. Um, we've ran Agile out of Cascade for quite a while as a business. And basically, we just do that by supplementing this whole process with dashboards. So we'll, we'll update all of the various items we're working on once a week. And then we have a dashboard that shows all of our items. And then we have a parking lot. 
and it's it's a pretty straightforward process. So when we when we talk about methodologies, sometimes people get wrapped up in the terminology, but Cascade at its core is really pushing you to work in an agile way. And then it's a matter of if you want to follow the very specific, like let's call this a rock or a status or an action versus just calling it a goal and then looking at it more frequently and adjusting it more frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was one question about, uh, so I, I have my personal question was about how to get into that, that second layer. Once you have that top layer, how do you get that second layer? And what have you seen um, more of a, on the practical side? But then I think a, a potential tie in question is, is there any different experience with nonprofit organizations? You know, does the process change by doing this? Or is it more or less exactly the same? Let's say it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty similar. So Cascade, we work with a lot of nonprofits. One of the ones that I like to bring up a lot of the time is the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Um, they're one of our better clients that have been around for three plus years. Most of their staff are volunteers. So that's going to inherently change the game of having a user in here and the expectations you have with that person, how much training you're gonna do, just the turnover of staff. That's not relevant to all nonprofits, I'm not saying it is, but um, it is an element of the nonprofit world that just changes the dynamic of who users are and how they interact with Cascade. We've seen in the past that some of our nonprofits will just group users together. So they'll maybe have like, here's our Naperville office, we'll have a user. Now, I would never recommend that to a corporate client, but if you have a series of volunteers manning your front desk and you just want to see how things are going on a week to week basis there, that's a really good way to supplement it. And keep the number of people limited in Cascade to make a manageable team, those kind of things. But all in all, nonprofits, other than just getting better pricing from Cascade, because we like to part of the work that you guys are doing, um, it's pretty similar stuff, depending a, a lot on the scale and size of the implementation. Um, so that's that question, Anthony, to your question. So when we look at I go to this all plan section and I can see at the corporate level, I have my four focus areas that I was showing you guys before. I've got a ton of goals. I've got my whole company involved here. But then when I look at this individual marketing plan, I have three different focus areas. I have a bunch of different goals and some are aligned, some aren't, and then I've got risks. So I'm going to dive into this plan here just by clicking this. This will take me to my marketing and sales plan. We have seen a lot of different companies manage this a lot of different ways, starting with these focus areas of, all right, do I want to make these the same as my corporate plan or different? And I honestly am not going to sit here and say that one is better than the other. I think that it really depends on the level of sort of autonomy or difference that your plan here, whether it be a subsidiary or a, a department or whatever it may be, or a location, compared to your top level plan. So for this marketing and sales plan, if they looked at this top level corporate plan and they see aggressive growth, that's inherent. They're trying to grow, that's gonna be pervasive in all of the focuses for the marketing team. Be a good manufacturer, not really relevant to the marketing team. Be more modern, not really relevant to the marketing team. Good place to work, yeah, potentially, but maybe only just like one goal. So for a team like the marketing team, I would definitely recommend have your own focus areas but make sure that you're keeping in mind all of the aggressive growth goals in the corporate plan, you should probably be aligning to. And if I look across this, this is essentially just a breaking out of that main focus area in the main plan into three sort of sub focus areas in the marketing and sales plan. So expand our market, no stone unturned, grow from within. Those are essentially just three different ways to think about aggressive growth and then fleshing these out quite a bit more and picking and choosing which pieces of this tie into that top level plan. So and I think, sense. yeah, absolutely. And from a culture piece, I think that's another piece that they have that the engagement is like, it's not like the corporate plan, especially depending on the culture of your organization or even locations. It's like, these are our priorities. These are like, yes, there's alignment, but we're not using exactly the same language because it's the plan that we came up with. It's the pieces that we came up with that we wanted to put all of that together. So um, I think that's super important culturally. And um, I'm gonna, Trevor's got a question, but uh, I wanted to just highlight Jenna, who's actually on our team, um, said with an organization with multiple levels, senior leaders, senior managers, middle managers, um, do you recommend them using all the same planning dashboard or having their own plan that aligns with the top level plan? And that was the 
example of that, right? Yeah, exactly. So we actually have the ability to um, customize this framework on a plan by plan basis as well. So you might remember from the last one, we had our objectives, projects, KPIs. For this one, we have a little bit different. We're gonna track departmental initiatives with KPIs and projects underneath them and risks and mitigation actions. This is just our demo side, it's a bit messy, but you get the idea. We can customize this on a plan by plan basis, but still say, all right, department initiatives are gonna slot under those objectives at the top of a plan. Um, just gives you a lot of functionality and ability to sort of customize this on an individual basis and then still align that to the top of a plan. So for example, if I'm looking at my fixed gear project plan, I don't need probably a lot of the same stuff. I probably just need individual tasks or actions that I can track on this on this plan and really dive into that um, from a more practical standpoint rather than like high level objectives. All right, Anthony, should I keep on the demo or do we want yeah. to go through any other questions? Yeah, we can keep going for now and then we answer a couple more questions before we finish. Cool. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll hurry along here. There are really two other pieces I wanted to show, which is just how we track some of this stuff. I won't get into a lot of the minutia because a lot of that is less of the sexy stuff and more of the how does it work piece. I would recommend if you're interested in learning a lot more about this, start a free trial, get in touch with our staff, get in touch with Anthony's team. Uh, we can work together on showing you the specifics, but just to give you an idea of how this actually adds value when you're talking about the execution of it, it's not just a place to house your strategy. It is the place to actually execute it and interact with this. And we wanna add as much automation to that process as possible. So when I say that, I mean, it's not just going in and manually, arbitrarily saying we're 63.13% complete with continuing our top line growth. What does that mean? It means nothing. So in, instead of just having somebody manually dragging a slider to, yes, I am green on track with this, Cascade gives you the ability to automate the various levels of your strategy so that you're tracking it in a way that makes logical sense. So this top level objective, I've set the tracking to be based on the child goals underneath it. Goal is just an umbrella term we use for project KPI objective. But basically we're just saying, give me the average completion of this KPI, this project and this project. And it did, and it said, okay, you're at 63%. You were expected to be just about done with this because we set up the tracking to be complete most of the way by the end of 2021 and then a little bit left on the end of 2022. So it's expecting me to be further along. So it's saying I'm behind on this, but I can go down to the projects and I don't want to track based on average completion of goals underneath it because there are no goals underneath this, but I can track this by tasks. So for this one, I built out individual actions, tasks of what I need to do to for this example, expand into the fixed gear market. I need to research the trends, execute our final phase of um, deployment and do some of these other things. As I tick these off, because I'm tracking via task completion, it's going to automatically push my progress forward. And again, when I built this project out, I'm kind of coming up with start, end date, my expected progress over time, which is all customizable. And then lastly, on a KPI level, I am tracking this as a sum of my project of my sub goals. Because if I click into this, you can see I broke out my individual annual sales targets or revenue targets here, which I'm tracking manually or ideally via an integration. So if I just go to this 2021, I think this one is completed or it's actually overdue. I was a little behind on my 2020 targets. You can see I'm just manually updating this via slider or just by click, clicking and typing in here. And that's actually what's driving up to my overall achieved revenue goal. It's just rolling that up automatically. So to recap, as a user, my objectives are auto-tracked. I don't have to update the progress for those at all. My KPIs are all rolling up to a top level KPI, but at most I need to come in here and manually update my revenue goal once a week, once a month, whatever. But ideally we're integrating this with your source system, like your ERP or CRM to just automatically update that progress for you. So you won't even have to update your KPIs and your projects. You're just going to have to come in and tick off which tasks you've completed since last time you've logged in. At a minimum, that's the um, 
execution part of Cascade, having your staff go in and they have a number of ways to do that. They've got their individual, my goals, my team page, where they'll see everything assigned to them, where they can go in and tick off all their different progresses. And then they can add narratives to explain more color behind this. Okay, I ticked off three tasks. I can add a comment explaining why I did that. I can tag my colleague here, maybe Melanie or Megan, whoever it is, and explain like this is why or whatever. To send her an email, by the way, that'll link her directly to this individual project where she can come and interact with it. So at a very simple, not very in-depth way, that's how we track progress of things. Um, there's a lot more behind this. So if I just expand this KPI, for example, you can see I've got a tracking curve over time. Looks like someone screwed with my demo site here a little bit. <laughs> um, but I've got the ability to track this versus an anticipated progress chart over time that's customizable. I can zoom in down to any period and see how I was doing. I can set up that expected progress to be based on a data input at the end of the month or continuous. Lots of ability to really interact with this and make it exactly how I want it to look and feel. Uh, can you speak to, um, I know you're sort of into it, the report as we start to, to wind down? Yeah, that's the last piece I was going to show here. So the last bit I was going to show is the reporting element of Cascade. Anthony, thank you for reading my mind. I've got two things I want to show you. First, snapshot reports. These are essentially a very detail-oriented way of looking at all the data out of Cascade. I'll show you a report, and then I'll show you a little bit about what you can do with it. So if I just start, this is a pre-generated report that I can save, click one button, see the newest version of it. And this is going to show me for this example, within each of my focus areas for my main plan here, what are my top level objectives and the projects and KPIs underneath them? Who owns them? What are the latest monthly updates, which we've structured in this case, customize this so that they're very structured and consistent. And then ultimately what's our timeline and am I behind or on track? And I can see that for my entire strategic plan here and get a really good overview. And like everything in Cascade, if I click this, it's going to open the sidebar where I can interact with it, update the progress, and that's going to real time update this directly on this report. Also, all these reports are customizable and exportable out of the system as PDFs, CSVs, et cetera. And I can really pick and choose which pieces I want to show down here. Like maybe I want to show historical completion as a column. I can move these around. Lots that I can do here to customize this report and then save it so that I can see, you know, what are my favorites? what have been shared with me, what are the ones that I own I can share with my colleagues, tons of flexibility here on the reporting side. And then the other piece to it is dashboards. This is the last thing I'm gonna show. Dashboards are the visual element of Cascade where I can see not only from a very high level on a Gantt view or from a narrative view, but also how am I doing across the timeline that I set for it. So for this one, it's my, my revenue target or maybe across my entire focus area is how am I doing just at a very sort of summary level. Lots of different ways to look at this. There's a board view. I also have like a KPI view that's really common where we can build out our main KPIs and track these over time. Ultimately, just giving you different ways to stay on top of your strategic plan, make decisions off of it, create visuals, export them, show people, get everyone involved. Awesome. So I'm going to ask one more practical question and then more logistical question before I do that. Uh, in the chat, there's a link to a 90 day free trial. Cascade's been super generous with us because we're partners to get a 90 day free trial to check it out. Um, you can definitely talk to Reed's team to get a demo if you want to do more in depth. Um, so the question, so I'm going to ask you about how the user and pricing works. Before I do that, we talk about all these reports, which looks great. And it's sort of uh, supposes that your team is going to update Cascade. So how do you make people, how do you make people, you see the language I used, uh, update their uh, plan progress, task goals, and that before it? Do you just lock them in a room? How do you go about that best practice? Yeah, I'd say it's, the, it's pretty much the opposite of that. It's um, if, you, if you lock people in a room and try to do it, you'll probably get two updates out of them. You'll get the first time that you all launch the strategy, and then maybe the second time or maybe the third time we'll skip one and then they'll disengage from it. It has to be a value proposition from the bottom up. They have to get value out of Cascade. Otherwise, it's just gonna be another tool. We've gone back and forth with that as a company where it's like, okay, we just need to make this as simple as possible for the end user to go in and do it. But guess what? 
filling out a Google form is as simple as possible, but people don't want to do that. Why? Because there's zero value added to somebody going and filling out a form so that you can see the results. So they don't want to do it. So we can make Cascade as simple as possible, which I would argue we have. Like if I go to that main page, you tick three tasks and then leave a comment and log out. But that's not the point. It has to be valuable to these individuals. So how do we do that? It's so much a cultural thing around celebrating success, the ability to communicate how they're doing, and ultimately seeing how they align to the big picture. Cascade is a tool. It's not a silver bullet. You can't just launch Cascade and expect everybody to suddenly understand strategy and understand how they fit in and understand why this is important. You have to educate people and show them, okay, I'll go to the main page here and just give you an example. All right, we've got our top level continued top line growth here. And I have this expand into the fixed gear market. Mary, how do you fit into the top level strategy? Well, you own this project, expand into this market. We only have two major projects that are going to help us outpace our industry this year. Mary, you're a critical part of us achieving our top line objective of achieving our growth this year. Now, that's a dramatic example, but let's pretend that we have a bunch of sub projects underneath this expanding to the fixed gear market, and they're owned by various members of the marketing and sales and various teams and showing them individually, okay, Aaron, John, this is how you fit into this picture. If your piece fails, this whole thing fails. That's just one part of it, but then also saying, okay, Aaron, when you create the initial designs for the prototype, let's celebrate that. Let's create maybe an incentive program or maybe just congratulating the person. That's where strategy can be more of a sword than a shield. It's not just this reactive thing that you have to look at when things are tough. It's something that you can really use to better your culture and drive people forward. So simplicity, making it really user-friendly and accessible, but also using it as a way for people to feel better about their job and as a value add, involved in the HR process, you're showing people when they're onboarding into your company, hey, this is our strategic plan. This is where you're gonna fit in. I'm gonna make you an owner on these goals. This is where you're gonna impact from day one. Driving that strategic culture is how you can get people to look forward to updating Cascade. That's awesome. I really like that analogy of using it more of a, as a sword than a shield to actually use it to drive things and move move it forward, not just like a reporting and a big challenge we see is feels like, oh, it's like more work and it's micromanagement versus like empowerment, which, you know, the line is very fine depending on what your your intention is. But, you know, it's really, really cool uh, perspective there. Uh, Reed, can you finish up by talking a little bit about pricing and how it works if people want to incorporate that with their teams? Definitely. So pricing a Cascade, you can go to our, our pricing page. It starts at um, roughly $50 a user. We have a minimum of, of five users on Cascade. So ultimately, you're going to be paying roughly in the realm of $3,000 US for the minimum team subscription of five users of Cascade. And that being said, we do have a free version of Cascade that is going to be launched in the next probably two or three months here. Um, so that's going to be coming pretty soon. So something to keep an eye out for. It's going to have some limited functionality, as you can imagine, but it will give you the ability to manage a plan, involve a small amount of team members. But that entry point is roughly $3,000 US for up to five people. And then it scales up from there. The pricing goes down pretty dramatically as you add more people, get more people involved. When you're looking at you know, 30, 40, 50 people, you're looking closer to the $10 per user per month range. So it, it scales down pretty quickly in terms of that because ultimately we're driving towards making Cascade affordable for most businesses to get maybe not every employee, but a majority of the employees, at least all the employees that directly own parts of the strategy. So usually the management supervisor level and above at the minimum, get them involved so that they're directly able to communicate what's what's involved. Um, as Anthony said before, we are offering um, people that are on this show today a um, 90 day free trial of Cascade. And then also I'd be willing to extend an additional 10% discount to anybody if you just mentioned this podcast or this um, webinar to anyone on our team, just mention it and we'll give you another 10% off as well for, for joining here today. 
Cool. All right. Sweet. And I, I didn't even make him say that. So, you know, he chose to do that. So that was awesome. Great. Thank you for so much for that. Um, if you do have any sort of detailed questions about pricing, talk to Reed. Reed, maybe you can put your contact details in the chat. Um, I highly recommend everybody uses that free trial link um, just because you can test it. You can play around and you can demonstrate to your team what it looks like. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing is, like Reed said, 10% of the plan is actually starting it. And then the rest is tracking and using it as an engagement tool for your team to support having them be part of it. And then, you know, uh, we just had a question come in about the nonprofits, which we talked about, but really allowing people an opportunity to see how the interconnectedness happens. You know, we talk to a lot of organizations who just feel like they're out of the loop. And when you're out of the loop, even for a minute, you feel you get disengaged. And with volunteers, it's super important that you keep them engaged. So another opportunity there, another opportunity to get to the best of your people. Uh, Reed, anything that you want to share as we finish up here? Oh, well, I can't hear you for some reason. Sorry, I muted myself because my dog was barking. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess this last thing is it's it's something that at the very minimum, if you're interested in this, and if even if price was you know maybe off putting or just the, it seems like a lot, ninety days at the very minimum is what you can get out of this. At the very least, you can digitize your plan because that's the first step. Think back to that first slide I showed where it's kind of the visibility then the accountability, then the alignment. It's it's a journey. And people like Anthony help you along that journey way faster than doing it on your own. So I'd recommend going there, but Cascade is just a tool to help you along that journey. As long as you're making strides, we can help you through those strides. We have a ton of content on our website that helps you do that, but just getting you to that point where you at least have visibility, then you can start getting people accountable, then you can start working towards alignment. It, it's okay. It's okay to do it in steps. I guess that's my, that's my piece. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a, a journey. Reed, thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. It's been awesome. Um, my invitation to you, we're going to send out the replay shortly after. Send this to your team. Send this to the boards that you work with. For me, I just didn't even know a tool like this existed. It, it's just because sometimes you just do it the old way because you've always done it that way. This is a new way to track and execute strategy that is going to help you it's going to pay dividends, huge, huge, huge. So uh, Reed, Gridley, thank you so much from Cascade. It's been awesome having you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, please put them in there. Otherwise, we are finished up for today. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, do all those things. Tell your friends, yell it from the roof of your building, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Reed. See ya.